Good evening and welcome to opening night of season five of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen Artisan Lecture Series. My name is Victoria Dangle and I am the Executive Director of the Society. For those of you who are not familiar with the organization, we were founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of New York City. There were 22 artisans at that initial meeting that represented all of the various trades, including carpenters, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among others. Today, our 229-year-old organization continues to serve the people of, of the city of New York through its educational and cultural programs, including our tuition-free mechanics institute, the General Society Library, and our century-old lecture series, of which the Artisan Lecture Series is a part. Is a part. The magnificent space you are in tonight is the library of the General Society. Founded in 1820, it is the second oldest library in New York City and one of the three city's three remaining membership libraries. Our book and periodical collections span two centuries and are suited to both scholarly research as well as recreational reading. The archives date back to 1785. And so, Tonight, we gather once more to pay tribute to the art of craftsmanship. The Artisan Lecture Series will devote itself to giving voice to internationally known artisans who will talk about the intricacies of their specialized crafts. The mission of the Artisan Lecture Series is to promote the work and art of skilled craftsmen to assist in ensuring their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for generations to come. Our Artisan Lecture Series is curated by General Society member Camille Weart, who brings to her curatorship her wide connections among the artisan community. The General Society extends its sincere gratitude to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the McQuesten Companies, Peter Panoya Architects, and Bauer and Dean Publishers for their support of the series. And now I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Camille Weart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Camille Weart, and it is a pleasure and honor to have you all here tonight. I'm going to um, briefly just announce the next lectures uh, coming up, and as well as our guest speaker this evening. Um, you have, I think, all received on your seat a, a list of events, and we invite you to attend them all. The next dates will be October 28th, featuring Ellie Wilner, a master frame maker, and very famous, well-known here, specifically in New York City. And on November 18th will be uh, Raphael Francois, a very young French master chef and um, works currently at Le Cirque. So please join us as well for these two events. So without further ado, uh, we welcome here tonight Marina Ruiz Molina, a master paper conservator at Metropolitan Museum of Art. And Ms. Molina will briefly take you through her training in Europe before she arrived at the Met in 2008 and embarked on the wonderful journey of conserving the 400, some 400 drawings of Louis Comfort Tiffany's workshops that were purchased by the Met in the 1960s. And, and we kindly ask you to keep your questions. There will be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, and we also invite you to join us for the reception that follows with Marina. So without further ado, please welcome Marina. Thank you, Thank you everyone, for being here tonight. Um, it's an honor for me to be part of the Artisan Lecture Series. I want to thank you, Victoria, for inviting me to be part of it, and uh, especially also Joe Rainey's. Um, his um, interest in conservation and paper conservation is definitely in the source of me being here tonight. Um, 
Regarding the, the profession of paper conservation and its training and its relationship to an artisan um, trade, um, I have to say that it might not be considered properly as, a, as an artisan trade, um, but the, the profession definitely drives, uh, um, draws much knowledge from um, certain important crafts such as uh, paper making, as you will see tonight in my presentation. Um, yeah, throughout the world, paper conservation is mostly um, studied in universities who offer programs that are a combination of uh, training um, based on science, art, is, art, art history, and also paper, uh, conservation itself. And um, um, that's exactly what I did. I was trained, I, I obtained my degree in conservation in the uh, school in Madrid. And later on, I continued my training as, a, as an intern and as a fellow in other museums of Europe, such as the Stelic Museum and the Rex Museum in Amsterdam. And then later on, I, I, I came here to New York and continued at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So my work is mostly um, focused on, on the, the care of uh, museum collections, as you see. And specifically tonight, I'll be talking about the, the work that is done at the museum. Um, to care for this collection of drawings that I consider a window into the way that um, these masters of, um, of um, crafts and, and design who were the people who worked for Tiffany and for the Tiffany Studios for um, over 70 years and um, the way they worked and the way they conceived their, their, their art is somehow um, still remaining in these drawings. My, my work is to, to try to preserve this um, crucial source of information for, for the future. And tonight I'm sharing this with you, with all of you. And so therefore I'm gonna be talking about Louis Comfort Tiffany, who as we all know was one of America's most celebrated artists. And he worked in nearly all media available to artists and designers in the 19th and early 20th century, including glass, ceramics, metalwork, textile, jewelry, painting, basically everything. The American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, holds a collection of over 400 drawings from his workshops. And the subject matters of these drawings are as diverse as were the catalogs of his legendary design company. They are preparatory sketches, cartoons, and presentation drawings for the myriad of objects that the Tiffany companies created with the ideal of bringing beauty into everyday life, whether a lamp on a table or an entire theater. Trained to be a painter by the 1870s, Tiffany had already begun experimenting with glass making techniques and in 1879, he founded his first design company. From then until the mid 1920s, Tiffany ran many interrelated design firms, including the Tiffany Glass and Decorating Company and Tiffany Studios, a prosperous interior design business that revolutionized the look of stained glass. The studios were known to be extremely innovative and dynamic, with hundreds of men and women working under the direct supervision of Mr. Tiffany. In the highly organized operations machinery of the workshops, drawings played a critical role not only for communication with clients and promotional purposes, but also during the design phase. The study of our collection provides scholars a window into the various ways the designs, the drawings were used. In this image of the glass shop, one can see how the craftsmen relied directly on renderings and full-scale cartoons. Beautiful works of art on their own right these drawings provide an extraordinary opportunity to dissect the creative process of the Tiffany Studios. Despite this enormous success that Tiffany experienced over his long career, his firm went out of business in 1924, and Tiffany Studios filed for bankruptcy in 1932, a year before his death. The state, with the entire content of the studios, was sold in two consecutive auctions. A large number of drawings were bought by the museum in 1967, sorry, after they were found in an attic room of a marble dealer in Long Island. They were acquired um, by the dealer, presumably from Laurelton Hall, Tiffany's country estate in Long Island, or from the Tiffany Studios when they closed in 1932. 
There is much uncertainty regarding the storage conditions of the drawings during those more than 30 years, but when they entered the museum in the 1960s, they were not accessible for proper study or exhibition because they suffered from extensive mold and grow, mold growth due to water damage. The deterioration was so severe that these drawings were tremendously disfigured and structurally unsound, not to mention that they posed a health hazard for handlers and researchers. In the late 1990s, the museum established a preservation initiative so that these works could be safely studied, exhibited, and prepared for publication. The biodegradation of paper is a very complex phenomenon. Without delving too deeply into the detail of its process, fungal and bacterial interaction with media and paper compromises the integrity of the artistic object at two levels, the structural and the aesthetic. The cellulose in the paper becomes the substrate and the nutrient of the fungal organism in a decay process that under the right conditions can take place in only a few days. Mold employs enzymes to break down the cellulose molecules during digestion. Once paper is subject to this enzymatic hydrolysis, its intrinsic physical qualities are transformed, and as a result of it, it not only becomes irreversibly weakened, but also much more permeable to moisture. Altered hygroscopicity, the property of a substance to absorb water from its surroundings, happens also as a consequence of other phenomena related to mold growth, such as the destruction of the sizing and the uneven distribution of the paper filling materials. The second consequence of biodegradation is the aesthetic alteration of the art object. Pigmentation induced by fungi disfigures art in the most dramatic ways. Pigments are biochemically produced by mold to serve several purposes. For instance, Black pigmentation is attributed to melanin, which protects fungal cells from damaging UV radiation. Extensive research continues to be done by microbiologists and paper conservators with the goal to better understand these extremely complex processes and find methods that can assist us to safely remove fungal body from contaminated paper. Although much has been accomplished in this field, this is one of those circumstances in which conservators are forced to confront our limitations and face the fact that in many instances these pigments cannot be removed without compromising the integrity of a support that is extremely fragile. Such was the case with this drawing, a beautiful sketch for a mosaic panel painted in watercolor over illustration board by Frederick Wilson, one of Tiffany's most distinguished designers. This exquisite drawing is one of the few examples in the collection of a design for a figurative mosaic. The contamination or removal of fungal deposits is always performed following a strict protocol of low pressure vacuum cleaning, which is usually carried out with the aid of a microscope to prevent unintentional damage to the paint. Given the complex multilayered structure of these drawings, which are often attached to vacuum boards and mud windows, prior to the contamination, we determine if the removal of the attached elements is advisable in light of their historic relevance. In some instances, removing them is necessary to gain access to all the laminated layers and guarantee the correct preservation of the primary support. Such was the case with this drawing, and this is the image of the primary support after the backing was removed. When addressing the cleaning of these drawings, extreme precaution must be taken due to the physical fragility of the damaged paper, but also, as I was explaining earlier, its accentuated vulnerability to water. A successful treatment must reach a delicate balance in the use of water, a powerful solvent that most effectively removes products of degradation, but that can also dangerously disrupt the chemistry of the paper structure. Stain removal usually consists of a rather complex set of steps, but I will briefly summarize it by explaining that the suction table is used to apply chemicals that dissolve certain fungal constituents. And what you see here is a suction table, exactly. Regardless of the level of success of any given treatment, it is virtually impossible to bring back the paper to a state close to the original condition, and the damaged areas continue to be weak and disfigured. Therefore, we remain with a double challenge of providing structural stability 
while regaining to the extent possible an aesthetic unity. In the case studies that I'm about to present, this was accomplished by creating paper pulp infills and overlays with a methodology that I have been develop, developing in our lab over the course of the last few years. This method takes the principles that govern traditional Western paper making and adapts them to the realities of the conservation lab and to the specific needs of the artwork. The material we use to produce our custom papers are pulps made from the cotton, from pure cotton and flax fibers that contain a buffer and a sizing. In selecting the pulps, we consider certain properties of the fibers, such as their hygroscopicity and their opacity. An advantage of forming custom-made fills and overlays from pulp is that we can make them close in color to the healthy paper. This can be achieved with several methods. Thus far, we've been using pulps that are pre-dyed with dyes, with reactive dyes, but we're now starting to incorporate pigments from the paper industry, which are even more light fast. Watercolor and acrylic colors are also employed in the form of glazes. The chosen method depends on the specific demands of each project. These pulps are, you, that we use are refined beaten pulps, where the raw or native fibers have already been purified and separated from each other. The beating process promotes the fibrillation that is necessary for flexible, strong paper to form. Fibrillation is the partial delamination of the wall of the plant cell, resulting in a microscopically hairy appearance of the wetted fiber surfaces. This tends to increase the relative bonded, bonded area between fibers after the paper has been dried. The pre-processed pulps need to soak in water and be mixed in a food blender to create the right amount of swelling and extra fibrillation that is necessary for the formation of a good paper. The following video illustrates the process that was developed in the lab to make these papers and attach them to the artwork. Once the pulp is ready, a template is made by marking both the losses and the areas that we want to cover with an overlay. By principle, areas that contain media will not be covered and will be reinforced only from the back. A screen is prepared with a sheet of non-woven polyester fabric called Holitex, attached with tape to a plastic frame. These tools replicate the molds employed in traditional Western sheet forming but are more useful within the context of a paper conservation lab. The template is placed on a backlight table and the screen over it. Plastic pipettes are used to pour the pulp over the screen, following the contours of the template that are made visible with the transmitted light. A gentle vertical tapping is performed with a brush to avoid entanglement and flocculation, and also to evenly distribute fibers in plane. By doing this tapping, we are replicating the leveling effect achieved when the vat man shakes the mold after pulling it out of the vat. Similar to the shake, the tapping also improves the evenness of paper orientation and thus the directional strength properties of the formed paper. In traditional hand paper making, the pulp is dewatered by filtration, pressed and dried to form a web structure, the sheet of paper. In the lab, we can simulate this process using a series of steps. After the paper has been formed, the screen is lifted vertically, creating a pulling effect and deposited over an absorbent blotting paper. Blotters filter the water in a manner that is equivalent to what happens during the traditional couching. The paper is dried on the suction table, and the, paper that, and the pressure that is applied between the two blotters is critical, as drying restraint guarantees the dimensional stability of the paper. Two papers are cast consecutively, an infill and an overlay. The infill must have the shape of the losses and must be as thin as the adjacent areas of the drawing. The overlay must be thinner and will cover the losses as well as the pigmented areas that we wish to conceal. Once it is completely dry, the first piece of paper that we have made, the infill, is attached to the artwork using wheat starch paste. The artwork 
is then ready to be gradually humidified in a chamber in preparation for the second step, the attachment of the overlay. Before bringing the drawing out of a humidity chamber, a very diluted solution of cooked wheat starch paste is mixed in the blender and placed in an airbrush bottle. The diluted paste will slightly strengthen the molecular bonding that forms among the fibers while still making the overlay easily reversible. The artwork is placed on the suction table and after making sure that it is completely flat and free of creases, a protective blotter is placed over it, leaving exposed the areas that will be covered by the overlay. The paste is applied with the airbrush over the damaged areas of the art and the overlay, which has been placed face down onto a piece of miler for easier handling. The overlay is then carefully positioned on the artwork and after making sure that the contact between the two papers is even, the artwork is covered with a thick blotter until drying is complete. Finally, the drawing is flattened by humidifying it in a chamber and placing it under weight for several weeks. This last step is necessary to release tensions on the drawing that may have formed on the suction table. Small areas of missing color on the lower right corner of the design were retouched by applying watercolor over the infield paper in a neutral tone adapted to the surrounding colors. Given that the area is unfortunately pigmented by reddish mold, the retouch is not intrusive. Even though the drawing still exhibits scars from the severe damage it once sustained, this procedure was effective in returning the artwork to a state where it can be contemplated without the destruction of severe staining and most importantly, it can be safely handled, photographed, and exhibited. Indeed, the exhibition of these drawings takes place following a rotation program in the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. In other cases, it is decided that the backing of the matte window is, is relevant, um, and only the infected areas are to be removed. This drawing is an example of such the decision-making model a presentation drawing for an organ screen for the Church of the Ascension in New York City. The back of the original illustration board is in rather good condition and bears a stamp of Faber, Rule and Company, the art supplies distributors who provided this kind of materials to the studios. With original branches in New York and Chicago, they imported Watman paper from England and attached them to laminated wood pulp boards to provide a rigid support for applications of ink, watercolor, and gouache. This stamp is particularly relevant today because it helps us narrow down the time of creation of undated drawings. Press advertisements and business directories confirm that the Boston branch of the company opened in 1909. Therefore, drawings made on illustration boards with a stamp that includes the Boston branch must have been created after that year. Furthermore, by knowing that they were made after 1909, we can surmise that the drawings were generated by the brand Tiffany Studios, which was incorporated in 1902. Once the decision is made to remove only the contaminated area of the board, the resected support must be compensated. Three-dimensional reconstruction must be accomplished in a way that creates as little stress as possible to an inherently weak support. The following is a method that has proven to succeed in adding minimal tension to the original boards while remaining structurally solid and aesthetically sympathetic. Several steps are cut along the resected edge to increase adhesion area. Multiple layers of paper are used to, um, as reintegration material. My preferred option is a handmade rag paper from the Richard Duba mill in France, manufactured mostly for printing these waterleaf papers are particularly soft and have optimal dimension response when subject to moisture and the right amount of pressure. They are cut with precision to align with the individual steps and attach to the artwork as well as to each other with methyl cellulose, a durable adhesive that has rather weak adhesion power and experiences little shrinkage during drying. Once all layers have been assembled, they dry under pressure for a few weeks. When the attached tin fill is, com is completely stable, color is added to the sides with watercolor. 
Final layers of paper are cast to match the characteristics of the original papers and are attached to the back and to the front. In cases where a more integrated restoration is wanted, modulations of color that blend with the natural discolorations of the paper around the edges can be added in the form of thin glazes of acrylic pigments applied with airbrush. Ethical considerations are always addressed when adding such large portions of support to an art object, but in cases like these, when the area of the drawing that is being retouched is so extremely disfigured and it affects only the margin and not the design, it is easier to make the choice of covering the original. This drawing, a design for a leaded glass window, is another example of the use of paper pulp to reconstruct and stabilize large areas of paper and lessen fungal staining. The difference in this example is that important inscriptions were present on the upper margin and needed to remain uncovered for future research. The inscriptions regained legibility after decontamination and cleaning, and once the backing removal was completed, it became apparent that important fragments on the top area were detached from the main body and that the drawing had large losses that affected the design. Paper pulp was used to cast infills to the right thickness and shape, and they were attached to compensate for the missing support. It was decided that a paper pulp overlay would be used to cover the areas of the design that were irreversibly stained by black melanin, but that the overlay should not conceal the inscriptions. So this piece of paper was cast, and the areas of the paper corresponding to lines of black ink marking the contour of the window in the design were cut out so that when the paper was adhered to the drawing, the media would be fully visible. Adhesion was accomplished on the suction table with the technique that I just described, followed by toning with watercolor to blend the overlay only in areas of the design. We decided that we should not reintegrate the missing parts of the ink lines, but that we should rather leave it to the matte window to suggest the full shape of the top quadrifoil and the right arch. The inscriptions revealed during conservation proved very useful to the curatorial staff who were able to locate the window made from this design as one from St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Salt Lake City, Utah. The Adoration of the Magi is an important drawing in our collection. It's the design for a chancel window that is a rare combination of fabrile glass set in place of fabrile mosaic. It is surrounded by an ornamental wall and by two columns, although the column to the left is missing due to mold damage. The design is composed of two layers, an illustration board depicting the three glass lancets and a matte window with a detailed rendering of the mosaic splays, the ornamental wall, and the columns. A photograph of the window erected in the Christ Church in Brooklyn was published in a 1922 promotional booklet by the Tiffany Studios but the window was destroyed in a fire and the surviving drawing remains an important record of the project. The mold damage was so severe and the support was so brittle that it was necessary to detach both layers and treat them separately before proceeding to reassemble them. For this presentation, I'm only referring of the, to the treatment of the matte window where a very different approach to retouching was taken. The losses in the design were so large that a more integrated restoration was necessary in order to enhance the drawing's perception and understanding, while representing, uh, respecting its aesthetic, historic, and physical properties. Given the hybrid nature of the artwork, a drawing that can be enjoyed for its artistic qualities, but also an architectural rendering and an archival record, an approach was chosen that was a combination of neutral and integrated retouching. For the outer brown columns, an average color that was inactive in relation to the entire painting was determined and applied with acrylic colors to the paper infills. For the ochre wall background, a prominent field in the drawing, it was deemed necessary to achieve a more integrated retouching, and this was accomplished through the imitation of the ornamental pattern. An infrared photography of the underdrawing was useful to prepare a stencil of the filigree motif. 
a piece of a sympathetic paper was toned by airbrush with an acrylic paint using the plastic stencil to create a pattern that replicates the original design by, with less saturated colors. After the reconstruction was finalized, the drawing was lined, attached to a museum rack board that replaced the original board and reassembled with the windows design. The heterogeneous nature of the collection, part history record, part work of art, makes it virtually impossible to predict what the treatment approach will be when the next drawing comes to the lab. It is very unusual in a museum environment to care for artwork that is in such dramatically poor condition. The Tiffany collection provides conservators an exceptional opportunity to test our capacity for innovation, creativity, and decision making, as well as to reevaluate our expectations of success and our ethical stance concerning certain aspects of our work, such as aesthetic intervention. Thank you very much. Now, if you have any questions, yes. Right. Yes. A certain amount that were a certain percentage that had a paper. better quality, and let's say all those were just on scratch paper. Right. Absolutely. Um, I have to say that there's a very diverse. Um, um, array of papers and supports in this collection. It's a large number of drawings and many of them are made on transparent paper. Some of them are made on um, illustration boards that we saw. And these illustration boards, like for example the, the, the cases that I'm illustrating today, are made on actually high quality watercolor paper. That, that, that paper is then attached to a bad quality board. And that is the source of many of the issues that that um, we are dealing with, but actually the main support of the, of the watercolors is um, precisely a high quality rag, uh, handmade paper. Many of them Watman, Watman papers made in England and imported to, to New York. So yes, absolutely. And actually I have to say also that, um, I mean, you've seen images of the extreme damage that mold makes on these drawings, but we are very fortunate that um, uh, for the majority of the cases, the mold actually, as you saw here, stays on the margins of the drawings and it does feed from the paper, which is a very high quality paper and has gelatin in it and it has, you know, uh, nutritious uh, material for, for them, but then they're not so uh, interested in the pigments. So the media and the, the design parts of, the, of, this, of these drawings for the, you know, in a, in, a, in a large quantity of cases has remained pretty much in very, very good condition, uh, fortunately. Hello, my name is Hi. Ricky Jane. I'm concerned about the corrosion on the paintings. Of how far advanced are they with the materials to remove the corrosion on paper? Uh, when, when you mean corrosion, you mean you're talking about the mold damage? The mold? Um, the mold damage is, is a very complex phenomenon, as I was explaining, and um, it, um, for what we know, it unfortunately remains practically um, irreversible. Once it's, there are many stages in the, in the damage, of course, and in some cases, the mold has um, simply stained the paper or remained on the surface of the paper, and we can remove much more of that, a, a lot of that uh, uh, mass um, with, uh, with a safe man in a safe manner. But in the most majority of these cases, unfortunately, has, it has already transformed the structure of the paper. So even though you're removing part of the, the, the body, the, the cells of those, of those um, fungal elements, um, the, the damage has already been done to the paper through the, through the digestion process that the mold. Well, you're talking about different parts of, a cons yeah, of, of the conservation um, um, case scenario, and you, you probably are referring to 
layers of material that have been, or patina that has been added to the surface of art, works of art. And that kind of situ or, or varnishes that were added through time and, has, and have um, oxidized and have aged and have uh, yellowed, and those can be removed in many cases very, you know, in, a safe, in a safe manner. It happens also in paper. Paper also sustains um, the, the action of grime and dirt. We don't, paper usually doesn't have a coating that protects it from, from the elements out, uh, outside of, 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 the, of the surface, as is the case with paintings. Um, but in, in, in many cases when that has happened, when the dust and the, the aging elements have deposited over the surface, there are techniques that we use with, um, with care again to, to remove, remove part of that. And in, in many cases you saw um, one slide that I showed where I was doing sur what is called surface cleaning. So I was actually using an eraser literally to remove some of that dirt and some grind and you could see like a, a white a white um, block of paper that had already been cleaned and was um, revealing what was, what was going on underneath. Mm -hmm. Could you? Oh, um, okay. How long does it take from the start of choosing a drawing to, to restore it to its completely restored? What's the time frame? Right, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, because it could take from anything from, say, one or two days of work, if it's a, a, a drawing that is in relatively good condition, until several months of work in, the, in some of these cases. Yeah, they're very they're painstaking um, processes that need to be done with lots of care, and it also depends very much on how large the object is. It could be from a few days to a few months, I would say. I, I was wondering if you could tell me, uh, are we to assume that these uh, drawings uh, sat there for 33 years and the mold was allowed to grow? And if so, is that typical? In other words, when a museum acquires mm -hmm. uh, things that are damaged, is there mm -hmm. nothing that could be done to sort of put it in a stasis until it right. can be conserved? Yeah, actually mold damage can happen very, very quickly. This could have happened in a matter of a few days. Is damage. If the conditions are right, if the temperature is high and there are high levels of humidity in a room, or if it's the, the object is actually touching the water, it could have happened in three days. Um, it happened many years before the museum acquired them. So when the museum made the decision of actually acquiring very, very moldy objects, it was uh, fully aware that it was a collection that was extremely damaged, but um, very interested in the potential of what could be learned through those drawings. Knowing that conservators can do a lot to stabilize these objects, um, they, they made the choice, the, oops, sorry, the, the conscious choice of, of purchasing objects that were extremely damaged because of how much we could learn about the process of the, of the Tiffany Studios through them. Also because they're beautiful works of art and, and by themselves and they can, they can be exhibited, but um, I think they were particularly interested in that. And certainly now that they have been acquired and this applies to the entire collection of the museum, measures are made so that this never happens again and not in our premises. So we have a very controlled, um, uh, a very strict control of the environmental conditions of the collection, as is the case with most um, institutions. I know that you have here actually um, a climatized um, chamber for the, for the rare books, for the very important part of the collection. And I think it's become more and more um, known and, and uh, the, the awareness has grown that it is a, an important matter that we never allow the environmental conditions to damage a collection to this to this extent. So were they sitting there for 40 some years since they've been acquired recently? Uh, they were acquired in the 60s and they have been um, they have been non-active. They have been stored in a very controlled way so that they wouldn't spread. That the, the, the mold wouldn't would be contained. And because, as I mentioned before, the, the treatment is very slow and very um, 
very time consuming. It's it's been the course of you know of almost 25 years now. It is started in the 1990s. This campaign to conserve them, um, and every year we we continue um, caring for for a few more of them, uh, so that they are they're part of the rotation or they can be they can go on loan, for example. But there's still maybe around a hundred of them that like the ones you've seen here on this on the screen today are still to be treated so hopefully one day they will be looking much much better joe please how long uh, do we have to wait before we can see an exhibition <laughs> well um you can see a few of these drawings each at a time at the dd wigmore gallery at the metropolitan museum of art um, they are, there's a, a room devoted to the work of Tiffany and, and the Tiffany Studios where you see examples of his uh, pottery and their lamps, their tapestry. It's a really beautiful room. There are windows too, of course. And one wall is devoted exclusively to drawings. And there's, um, uh, there's an intern, um, f an intern that um, is... Um, um, selected by the Tiffany Company, actually, and uh, funded by the Tiffany Company, who one, spends one year working on these drawings, studying them, at least one aspect of them, because they're multifaceted, too. And um, she, in, under, under the, the supervision and the knowledge of the curator of the department, who is Nani Frieling Heisen, she's been in charge of this collection of American deco decorative art for, for the last 20 years, um, decide on a specific rotation. So for example, the rotation right now is mosaics. And the upcoming rotation, which will be up probably in January, will be figurative mo mosaics, uh, specifically. So hopefully you'll be able to enjoy that anytime you go. And then uh, on top of that, they do travel sometimes to, to other, other shows. There's been, uh, there, there, there've been shows in the city, like in the Museum of Biblical Art, give a, um, had, a, had a show where some of these drawings were up. Uh, a question. I would guess that, these, that what we're seeing here are kind of an intermediate um, step, that mm -hmm. these are colorized drawings done by a designer to both show to the customer, this is what you will get, yes. let's say to the trustees of a church, Precisely. as well as to show to the uh, craftsman, this is what I expect you to do. Yes. Are there also um, detailed instructions by which the craftsman cut the glass and created these things? Right. Um, that's a, an, an excellent question, too. Um, yes, these drawings are um, presentation drawings, some of them, as you saw, and those were, uh, um, they were um, sent to the client or shown to the client and sometimes asked, they, were, they would ask the client to return the drawing. Um, whether that would be the only drawing they made so that they had that as a, as a, as a reference for the craftsman, or they made two of them, we don't know. Maybe it depended on, on each situation. Um, but we know that at some point, um, the, the, the designer probably created something that was a cartoon from that rendering, from the color rendering. They would make a cartoon. And in the case of, for example, um, mosaic panels, it, it would be different for each kind of object. Glass windows would be different from glass, from glass um, uh, lamps and from mosaics. But in the case of mosaics, they used the, the, the cartoons which had extremely detailed information on the shape of each tessera, the color of each tessera, were chosen by the artisan. The designer many, many times was the same craft uh, person. And they chose, they selected the, the exact kind of glass and the exact nuance of color, and then they, uh, they, they created each, they, they displayed each shape over that cartoon, which would then be destroyed in the process of, of building up the mosaic. So we don't have cartoons for the mosaic panels, 
because they were destroyed in the process. But we do have cartoons for the glass windows, which were made separately, independently. And those provide a lot of information on exactly me measures from the floor or um, indications for, for, for the craftsmen. In some cases, not, not every one of them, but in some cases we do yeah, have those. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, Victoria. interest as a young adult or what how did you end up in this field um, well I think I've always wanted to be a paper conservator and I don't know why <laughs> I, I came to the United States for the first time in 1989 as a um, exchange student to a high school for un my senior year so there's there's a school book that's something that we don't, know, we don't do in Spain, but, but you do here. So somebody in the school book um, team decided to do an interview, to, to do an interview of, of the foreign exchange students, and they interviewed me, and they asked me what do you want it to be, and I answered, I want to be a conservator. I don't know why, but there's, there's proof that I wanted to be a conservator when I, when I was 17, so um, I've always, loved um, art and anything that is related to art and also um, crafts and anything that has to do with beauty and with materials and using materials for, to, to convey ideas and to convey beauty. Um, but I'm not an artist. So I guess that's, that's the answer. You want to be surrounded by it, you want to be part of it, but I don't need to express my own idea other than share it with others. Yes, I think, or whoever, I think she, she was there first, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, so I understand the artistic aspect of it. Um, are you naturally very good with chemistry and science, um, or did you have to team up for that? Yes, um, well, Chemistry and, and biology, in this case, as you see, is definitely a very important part of our work. So it is a very strong component of our training. Uh, when we go to school, we have to go through chemistry. And actually, in, in the United States, if you want to go to a conservation program, you first, which is a master's degree, you first have to have an um, um, a undergraduate degree in chemistry. So. It is a very important part of it, but we are not scientists either. It would, it's, it's important to understand the, the processes that happen in materials and the, the products that we're using to transform those materials. It's very important that we understand the, the principles behind it, but we also have to add other layers of, of understanding those, those materials, such as the historical aspect or even the aesthetic aspect, sometimes philosophical questions arise. You know, why would you do something if, if that was meant to be used in a different way? So it's a very multidisciplinary um, activity, but science is a very important part of it, for sure. So you had mentioned that the museum had some health concerns. Did you have to follow any specific protocols for ensuring the safety of yourself? Yes, okay. absolutely. And you saw some of the gear, right, mm -hmm. and some yes. of the images. It's very, very important that we use, that we follow very strict protocols so that we don't contaminate anything else in the, in the lab and in the collection, and that we don't expose ourselves to the, these um, elements which are patho pathogenic. This mold is not active. What you see here and what I treat every day is not active mold. It's been inactive, inactive for many years. It's, not, no, it's known that mold cannot stay alive, so to say, for more than 30 years the most, at the maximum. So, um, and the conditions that they're, they're stored in are just not, they're not viable right now. But even though it is not active, it doesn't mean that it's not pathogenic for, for human beings. So it is very important that we take very strict measures of using um, you know, protective gear, always gloves and disposable <coughs> coats and, and masks and respirators. And that. It's not comfortable to work with that, like that, but it's important that we take those measures because it's something that 
um, it, it, it's, it, um, how do you say, it's um, accumulative. It's an accumulative action. So that's why it, it is so important that people who work with book collections, archives, are very aware of that kind of situation. And whenever there's anything that resembles mold, they take the right measures and they don't expose themselves to that. I have kind of a silly question, but that wonderful old book smell, what is it that we're smelling? Is it the mold? Is it, what is that? Can you yes. tell us? Um, you're probably smelling a combination of, of, of things. And yeah, mold dew or mold that has not quite developed um, could be, could be a, a part of it. But you can, you're also smelling the, um, the dust that accumulates. You're also smelling... Um, part of the part of the degradation of the paper that happens and it's just contained uh, within the block, the text block, the leather, the products that were used to to create it, the 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 animal glue that was used to paste those covers and is aging over time. So it's a accumulate accumulation of of circumstances. But the one very strong smell that you, you do identify, identify from others as probably mold, and you should be careful. Because mold is not always visible. So you have to be careful when that, that happens to you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the uh, terrific presentation. I'm curious about... Uh, how you analyze the artist's original work in terms of the light that you use, whether you use filters or uh, infrared or x-rays. Mm -hmm. That's one part of it. And then when you restore it, do you take into account uh, the light that the w work will be displayed in, whether it's incandescent, daylight, or fluorescent? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's... Um, Yes, for both questions. Um, we use, we use multispectral imaging to understand the work better. And by what multispectral imaging, I understand um, by subjecting the artwork to uh, the different, the, the, a broad spectrum of the wavelength of, of light, including ultraviolet and infrared, which are not visible to the eye, but that can actually uh, uh, convey a lot of information that is there. It just needs to react to that particular wavelength. So um, we do use infrared, for example, to understand the, identify the existence of underdrawings, um, for example, and also to discern between inscriptions and mold damage. Um, the inscription that is made on, for example, graphite, will absorb the light, the infrared light, in a way that is different from the way the mold will do it. So in an in a, in a area that you just see black, if you expose it to that particular type of light, you will actually be able to read an inscription sometimes. Um, then we use, we use infrared also to understand the nature sometimes of certain type of, of pigments, for example, um, iron golinks or iron-based inks. Um, are transparent to infrared light, so that you're, you don't see anything when, when you s look at it with the infrared. And that's an indication that that might be an iron gold ink, for example, for an underdrawing, for example, or for, for one of the inscriptions. Uh, we use ultraviolet also to look at pigments. Pigments re react different when, when uh, they are excited by, by the light, by the, by the ultra, ultraviolet light. So, for example, zinc white will manifest itself differently than, than um, uh, um, lead white would. So when you look at, at drawings with ultraviolet light, you would be able to say, for example, that, that white um, is probably a zinc or a zinc-based white, which means that this drawing cannot be older than, you know, 18, 1870 or whenever that particular pigment was made. So sometimes it's an indication of how it was made or a, a certain quality of a, of a pigment. 
Sometimes it can also be a, a sign for a, a degradation, a stage of, a, of degradation. And um, we record all this information with you know, the best possible ways with our technology. And uh, when it comes to uh, toning, and that's the, I think the, 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 the second part of your question, uh, how we use light for trying to adjust our, our um, fields and our colored fields in combination with the art, not on the art itself, but next to the art, we try, as you were suggesting, um, um, we try to take that into account what kind of light it will be used in the gallery. So usually it is um, daylight, a type of daylight that, um, that, it, that is fluorescent. And, and within that, that, strain, that wave range, we, we stay. Because pigments and surfaces will look very, very different when you look at them with a different source of light, obviously, as, as we all know. So they will just respond very in, in dramatically different ways if you don't have that kind of consideration into account. Thank you. Thank you so much. Marina, yes. on behalf of the General Society, I'm delighted to present you with a citation oh, commemorating wow. your wonderful, eloquent talk this thank evening. You. So thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. My honor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we're also, of course, making you an honorary member of the library. So thank oh, you wow. for your yes. beautiful, intelligent, thorough, thoughtful, scientific presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. My honor. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. It means a lot. Thank you. Wine and cheese. Oh, when there's a reception, there's some wine and cheese. Thank you.